Because you see, the best part about teaching middle school is you love them and you like give your heart to them and then you go to your house at the end of the day and they go somewhere completely different from you. Hey, so you're taking the Praxis 5047. Well, you're in good company. I'm Martha, I'm a middle school teacher and I've partnered with 240 to help teachers pass their certification exams. This video is going to prepare you for the Praxis Middle School English Language Arts exam. And this video is gonna cover three things, what's on the test and how to study for it, the most likely concepts that will be on the test, and we're gonna look at a few practice questions. Let's think of this like a great book we can't wait to dive into. No, not that book. Yeah, a book we can't wait to dive into. The Praxis Middle School English Language Arts exam is made up of four content categories, which are the big areas. Each category is worth a certain percentage of your exam and has a certain number of questions to answer for it. There are two styles of questions on this exam, selected response and constructed response. A selected response question is a multiple choice question. A constructed response is like an essay. The selected response portion accounts for 75% of your overall score, while the constructed response makes up 25%. There are two constructed response questions in all one in the reading category and one in the English language arts instruction category. But here's what we'll do. Let's briefly overview each content category, dive into an essential concept or two from each one, and then we'll focus on strategies for tackling your CRQs after that. Oh, and then I can't wait to show you some practice questions at the end. All right, now that we know what to expect, let's dive into chapter, I mean, category one. Category one covers reading. Pretty broad, right? That's the beauty of a 240 study guide. We've taken the guesswork out of what to study so you can enroll in your guide and get right into what you need to know to pass your test. But don't worry, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a preview of that now. The reading category is divided into two sections, general knowledge and literature. General knowledge covers characteristics and terminology associated with different literary genres and subgenres. This even includes knowing specific titles and authors of major works you might use in your classroom one day. There's a nice list of those in the study guide. The literature section is where your own text analysis skills will come into play. Expect to see reading passages of various links and styles and answer questions about them. One type of passage to expect is poetry. Analyzing a poem might seem like a daunting task, but rest assured, they are generally short and have a very specific idea to convey. Let's take a peek inside the study guide to hear a poem and then tips for analyzing its theme and structure. A Jellyfish by Marianne Moore. Visible, invisible, a fluctuating charm. An amber-colored amethyst inhabits it, your arm. Approaches, and it opens, and it closes. You have meant to catch it, and it shrivels. You abandon your intent. It opens, and it closes, and you reach for it. The blue surrounding it grows cloudy, and it floats away from you. The theme of a poem is the specific idea the poet wishes to convey or the main message he wants to get across. Determining the theme of a poem is a similar process to finding the main idea of a passage. Ask yourself, what does the poet want me to understand by reading this poem? The poet of a jellyfish wants us to understand that some parts of nature are not meant to be held by human hands. A theme of this poem is the intangibility of nature. The structure of a poem is the way it's organized and presented to the reader. This includes its rhythm and rhyme scheme. Think about how the poem sounds when it's read aloud and how that contributes to the tone or meaning of the poem. A jellyfish is written in short lines, visible, invisible a fluctuating charm. This structure creates a rhythm that mimics the quick yet flowing movement of the jellyfish the poet describes. I'd love to be floating in the ocean right now, just like that jellyfish. If you would love to learn with videos just like these, we have plenty in the study guide, along with instructional content, flashcards, and practice questions, all aligned to your exam. Okay, now that we've hit some highlights from the reading category, let's skip ahead a few pages to category three. Don't worry, I won't forget about category two, I promise. 
Content Category 3 covers writing, speaking, and listening. You can think of this one as your communication category. You'll need to know all about different types of writing in addition to making both oral presentations and written content effective. In fact, on your exam, you'll see questions that ask you to look at a piece of writing and choose the best way to improve it. Let's dive even deeper into this. When you're determining the best way to revise a piece of writing, we've got some guiding questions you can ask yourself. If the question is asking about the organization of the piece, check if the writer used transition words and consider whether the sentences are in the best order. To revise clarity or word choice, look for what needs to be added or removed, or a word may need to be substituted for a different one to convey the desired meaning or mood. When evaluating author's purpose, think of ways to make the purpose clear and consistent. Often a thesis statement is the key here. When asked about audience, consider the writer's tone as well as the level of words used or the presence of any slang or specific jargon. Look, questions about writing can be tricky. Let's dive into the study guide to see a video snippet with a great tip. Questions about writing may be tricky for the test taker because evaluating writing can be subjective. What sounds clear to you may not be the most concise phrasing according to the test. The nuances of the English language come into play when evaluating writing. So what can you do about it? Look for the answer that best demonstrates the skill or topic in question. We've made it through our two big categories, but we can't just swim past the next two. I want to make sure you know what to expect from all the portions of your exam. Let's back up to category two, and then we'll swim like a jellyfish all the way to category four. And don't forget, we'll dive deep into those CRQs after that. Category two is all about language use and vocabulary. Expect to see questions about standard English conventions, determining word meaning, the use of print and digital reference materials, and variations in diction and dialect. We have all of this covered in the study guide, but right now let's really dig into determining the meaning of words. There are several strategies to use to determine the meaning of an unfamiliar word, such as using context, syntax, or morphology. Let's zero in on that last one. Morphology is the study of word form in a language. Words are formed with morphemes, which are the smallest meaningful units in a language. Let's take a deeper dive into morphemes. We can categorize morphemes as roots and affixes. Roots are the basis to which affixes may be attached. They provide the core meaning of a word. A root may be free, meaning it can stand alone as their own word, or bound, meaning it cannot stand alone. Examples of roots that can stand alone include those derived from the Anglo-Saxon language, such as help, love, and friend. Examples of roots that cannot stand alone include Greek and Latin. Geo, meaning earth, is an example of a Greek root. It can be found in words such as geography and geology. Omni, meaning all, is an example of a Latin root. It is part of words like omniscient and omnivore. Now, let's take a closer look at affixes. Affixes are morphemes that can be attached to roots to modify them in some way. An affix cannot stand alone as its own word. Affixes can be categorized as prefixes and suffixes. A prefix comes before the root of a word. Examples include un, re, and dis. A suffix comes after the root of a word. Some examples are ed, full, and ing. Not only will you need to be able to use morphology to determine the meaning of a word, but you'll also need to identify different parts of words and describe how they're formed. All right, I know we jumped around a bit, but I wanted to give you the biggest stuff first. Didn't sting, did it? Okay, so what's with the jellyfish? I like jellyfish. Time for category four. This category is all about English language arts instruction. Sounds pretty important for a future middle school English teacher. This category covers strategies for supporting language, instructing students to participate in groups and communicate effectively, and choosing texts to facilitate teaching reading to students. You'll also need to know about teaching writing to students and how to assess everything you've taught. It's definitely a lot, but I have a good feeling about you. You can do this, especially with 240 on your side. Let's highlight a key concept from this category. Part of instructing students, especially in writing and in preparation for oral presentations, involves being able to identify credible sources. Let's take another peek inside the study guide to hear more about this. Credible sources are ones that the reader can trust. The information presented in them can be backed up with evidence. To determine whether or not a source is credible, ask yourself who, what, where, and when. 
Who wrote it? Determine whether or not the author has a known agenda or bias. What are the key claims? Make sure there is evidence provided to support them. Where is the source from? Credible sources are typically from well-known, reputable publications. When was it written? The information could potentially be outdated by more current research. Peer-reviewed publications are some of the most credible out there. Peer review is the evaluation of new work by other experts in the field before it is published. This process ensures the quality and validity of the source. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right, we've made it. Let's learn all about those CRQs. Multiple choice questions are more rigid. These CRQs are more free flowing, like an invertebrate. What? It was, it's natural, it makes sense, okay. Consider this a super helpful supplemental resource in our book. There are two CRQs on the English language arts exam, the textual interpretation question and the teaching, reading, or writing question. You'll only be given 30 minutes for the CRQ section, so aim to spend 15 minutes on each one. Let's talk about textual interpretation first. You'll be given a passage. It can be a poem or excerpt from a variety of genres and sources. Then you will write a brief essay in which you identify literary devices used by the author and analyze how they contribute to the overall meaning, tone, or theme the question may have asked about. Because you don't have a ton of time, do not plan to write an opening or closing paragraph. Instead, I suggest you get right to the point. If the question has two parts to it, plan to write one paragraph per part. Here's a tip. When analyzing the devices used by the author, pay attention to what stands out to you the most when reading, what invokes the most feeling, and any patterns or repetition. Here are some key literary devices and examples to review. Now, let's talk about the teaching, reading, or writing question. This one requires you to put on your teaching hat. You'll be given a student's response to a reading or writing assignment. Then, you will write an essay in which you answer three tasks. Identify the student's strength, their weaknesses, and an instructional activity you would use either to target their weakness or build on their strength. And when you write your response, you can organize your paragraphs to match those three tasks. Again, no introduction or conclusion necessary. Here's a tip. Make sure the weakness you identify is significant. That means it impacts their comprehension or the effectiveness of their writing. And there's more than one place that is evident in the student's response. You know, the best way to prepare for the CRQs is to practice. We don't have time to answer a textual interpretation question together, but let's look at a teaching writing question. The 240 study guide has more full length prompts for you to study with, along with sample responses. Okay, here's our prompt. It's seventh grade and they're writing personal narratives. So our student is gonna write about a time when they felt surprised and we'll need to look out for engaging storytelling, beginning, middle and end, sensory description, and lessons learned. That gives us some ideas for what to look for as a strength and weakness. Here's the student response and those tasks we'll need to answer. You can pause here to read it. Then I'm going to show you how I would answer. Okay, let's identify this student's strength. Remember that there's not only one right answer for these, but what stood out to me was the last paragraph. Here, he clearly summed up the lesson he learned. He was able to articulate his thoughts in a mature, logical way. And telling what you learned from the experience was listed in the directions. He did a great job with it, so I'm gonna choose that as his strength. Now, let's identify the student's weakness. I noticed that this piece is lacking in description and detail. The features of writing included sensory description, and I don't see evidence of that here. The only mention of how the party looked was when he said it, overlooked a lake and was a nice place. This doesn't give us enough detail to be able to visualize it. And here, he listed who was there, but we don't know what they look like. He seems to be telling and not showing. Plus, it's his favorite Mexican restaurant, so there's probably lots of smells and tastes to describe. Now, we need to determine what the teacher should do. I think it's most straightforward to address their weakness. Again, there's not only one correct answer. You'll just need to make sure that the activity or strategy you choose is specific and you explain exactly how it would help target the weakness. I'm going to suggest a story description activity based on the five senses. It could be a three column chart that lists the five senses and has students write what they observed as well as list some adjectives. 
Now, after you've planned your answers to these tasks, you would write them out in paragraph form, making sure to include evidence and quotations from the student's work to support the strength and weakness. Now, we could talk about CRQs and jellyfish for hours, but that's all we have time for right now. If you have a question, drop it in the comments. We'll be watching the comments section and 240 is always here to help. We've made it to the epilogue. We just covered what to expect for the CRQs, and now let's get some practice answering selected response questions. These practice questions will show you how the four categories can appear on the test. We'll go back to where we started, category one. Let's do some text analysis and zoom in on a literary movement. Here's an excerpt from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace and reverberation of thunder, of spring, over distant mountains, he who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. And here's our question. Which of the following aspects of the American modernist literary movement does this excerpt exemplify? As America expanded westward, settlers learned to tame the American wilderness. As America diversified, new ideas challenged society to grow and evolve. As America becomes more populated, we must not destroy its natural beauty. Or as technology and science progressed, people lost faith in society as a whole. The last one is our best choice. It identifies the ideas present in the American modernist literary movement from 1910 to 1945. In The Wasteland, T.S. Eliot shows the erosion of the American dream as people lose faith in the institutions around them. And if you were to miss that while taking your practice quizzes in the study guide, you can see immediate feedback to help you while you're studying. Hmm, let's see if our next question is a little bit cheerier. Let's evaluate a piece of writing about ducks. Which sentence should be removed from this paragraph to maintain clarity and purpose? Sentence one, two, three, or four. Pause if you'd like some time to read the passage. The correct answer is two. It is the only sentence that does not focus on the bird's habitat, so it should be removed. Category three, done. Let's keep it moving. I told you we'd see a question on morphology. Here it is. Which of the following best describes auto in the word autograph? Root, derivational affix, suffix, or onset? Root is the one we want. Auto is the Greek root meaning self. You made it to the last question. This one is from category four, English language arts instruction. An eighth grade class is studying accuracies and inaccuracies in the media, and students have been asked to self-select an article and rate the article according to the validity of the information. A student has found an article on a reputable news site, but has noticed that much of the information presented in the article does not align with coverage of the event on other sites. What is an appropriate guideline for the student to follow? Choice B is the one we want. Students should be advised to review the facts of the event in order to make an informed decision. Reviewing other articles will help the student to confirm the accuracy or inaccuracy of the information provided in the first article. And that's it. We've practiced a question from every content category in your exam. Congratulations on finishing the video. If you found it helpful, give it a like. There is still plenty more to learn. If you really wanna make sure you're prepared for the Praxis Middle School English Language Arts exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 study guide. It has plenty of videos, so you can watch or listen while doing chores. It is test aligned, so you know precisely what you need to study, and it has hundreds of practice questions, so you can be sure you're ready. And it has the money back guarantee. We know you're ready to write your own story as an English teacher. So click the link below right now and get started. You know, you're not supposed to pee on jellyfish stings. Did you know that? That's just like an old wives' tale. Oh, you're, just, yeah. you're just peeing on people for no reason.